Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Vladimir. A really, really interesting take on a man whose work, you know, really showed the complexities of existing in two separate realities and the challenges that that seems to have presented. Um, a literary genius, clearly, but one that wouldn't necessarily link to Pan-Africanism. As I said, so your chapter on him for me was very illuminating um, and definitely raised a number of questions which I'd like to ask you in just a moment. Um, so thank you for such a wonderful examination of his work. Uh, so let's just move swiftly on to the second segment of our event, which is where I get to pose some questions to you, Vladimir, um, sure, yeah. about your chapter and about the life of uh, Derek Walcott more broadly. So the first thing that I wanted to just ask you about was whether you could just explain what it is about his life and work that leads to him being classed as a Pan-Africanist. Um, yeah, think... I'm not sure whether he actually referred to himself as such or not, but what would, how would that link be made? Okay, as someone just asked a similar question in the chat, so that's good, okay. I, I guess I could answer it in one. Um, you know, at the time of the conference, when I was asked to present on Derek Walker, I mean, it was very obvious to me that, okay, but there's also Kamau, but it, I, I, I took it up as a challenge and I thought to myself, you know, there's the idea of identifying with a cause. To see that Derek Walker would identify as a Pan-Africanist, I would say probably with some confidence, definitely not, right? But do, does he see some connection between, between himself and black people worldwide? Definitely, yes. Um, does he see himself, um, but he also sees himself as a West Indian and he recognizes that that comes with other aspects as well. The, the thing is, you know, the identification with any of these kind of labels um, can in many cases require disavowal of others. And what, uh, one of the things he's claiming here is that need not be the case. Um, and probably he does so by not identifying and, and giving himself the ability to be all as, as Earl Lovelace says. What I think is his place in Pan-Africanism though, is to point to some of its inner contradictions and which are the inner contradictions of I, I think of any movement um, where there's a collective effort and a collective kind of thinking through of issues. Um, which can transmogrify into, into something that restricts the freedoms of those within it. I'm not saying that it has already, but I'm saying any movement like that has the, the, the possibility of doing that, of, of trying to create a reified and monolithic whole. And, it, and as with politics and politicians, everybody needs to know the point at which to stop. And I think it's good to have within whatever movement, the reminders of that, right? The reminders of these kinds of things as well. I mean, even within Black movements in the US, you had reminders from the women within these movements about some of the things that, the contradictions that existed within these movements that people were content to kind of just skim over and, and, and move forward um, with the bigger questions or the grander narrative. But the grander narrative and, and at least the grander vision being accomplished is a function of answering these questions. Um, how are women being treated within this movement? You know, how are um, how does this? How do you differ in how you deal with dissent? How you deal with disagreement within it? How you deal with an exposing of the inner contradictions? And I think that strengthens a movement. So whether he was an unwitting Pan Africanist or a reluctant one or one that not one at all, it's good to have him within there. Um, it's very good to have him within there if the movement is to be something that really is liberatory uh, and not just something that achieves a, a different kind of monolith, a different kind of um, tyranny. Um, yeah. Okay. So do you think then that we have to be quite careful about black power potentially being seen as something more stifling potentially as we put maybe viewed it as opposed to empowering. So like this leading to people feeling alienated or becoming like islands, as he described, is that a balance that you think we need to be quite careful with? Yeah, I think, I think in fact, um, that the Caribbean is a very, you know, given that Pan-Africanism is this large movement covering a part of the world, you know, where black people are, I think the Caribbean is a very, very important part of that because unlike perhaps unlike um, black America, unlike perhaps Africa, 
there are these serious complexities of our history. There are these um, ambiguities of our history that, that I think um, asks hard questions. You know, it's, everybody has to remember in, in any movement, the aim is not so much to replace the people who are your oppressors, but to replace their way of doing things that, that, that caused you to be oppressed in the, in, the, in the first place. So you need to look very carefully at structures, as, at the shape of that oppression, at the shape that made this behavior possible. And if you're not coming with anything that's going to replace that, then you're very likely to just become them in, 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 in new clothes. Um, so the Caribbean splinters, you know, the, the idea of identity kind of splinters in the Caribbean. It's not that Caribbean people don't consider themselves well, Black or African descended people don't consider themselves Black or African, but they recognize in it um, that is an aspect of their, 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 their um, identity, but, 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 there's, but identity is a very complex thing no, and, and it is not a stagnant thing either. Um, and I think in a spatial, in a racial, in an ethnic sense even, the Caribbean has that. And Walcott is, I guess, one of the proponents of that kind of understanding of that moment of splintering that, that asks some more difficult questions than where you, know, you have these stable ethnic identities. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. So considering um, the way that he spoke about, about Black power and his quite open reproach of that movement, how was his work actually received in the Caribbean? How do people receive his work? You know, um, I think Earl Lovelace is a good example of um, how that work was received because Earl Lovelace was his friend, but someone who disagreed with him often, you know? Um, and I think Walker was somebody who inspired, you know, uh, from what I gather, extreme responses on either pole, you know, people who really rejected his stuff and, and, and some people who, but what you found was you could not ignore him. You could not ignore him. And that is because he was pursuing a vision. He was pursuing a vision. And, and essentially that's kind of what you want within a, a movement or within a people. People who are pursuing the vision from their own unique strengths, their own unique um, contributions that they're bringing that, inevitably adds to the, the, the overall discourse. So mm -hmm. what you found was that whether anyone, whether people received his work well or didn't, they felt they had to contend with it, both because of its accomplishments, its, its strength, um, and his ability to realize his vision, you know, whether you disagreed with it or not. Um, because the challenge for a critic is always, yeah, you could criticize somebody's vision, but can you realize yours, <laughs> you know? Um, in St. Lucia, because I am from St. Lucia, uh, other poets like John Robert Lee were from St. Lucia and Walcott, you could imagine, is a towering present to have at the beginning of your literature, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But his example to most Caribbean, most St. Lucian writers, they don't become derivatives of Walcott at all. What you find happening is that what they have taken from him is that industry that he, he exemplified is the ability to bring into being an individual vision and trust that it will contribute to the overall tradition rather than a kind of ideological towing the line of a particular aesthetics or poetics or whatever. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So the chapter raises some really interesting questions about what it means to be authentically Black um, mm -hmm. and the extent to which we need to abandon what is maybe non-Black, by right, the culture of the, the colonizer. So do you think that this abandonment of Western culture is, is important in order to achieve Pan-Africanist ideals, or is there a way, as Walcott attempted to carve for himself, to kind of exist in both spaces? Um, I remember some at the at the time of the conference. I, I, I you know, there was this paper, um, this this essay that I wrote, but there was also the speech that I gave there, which was a little friend. And one of the things I was trying to drive home is this idea that what we have as Black people, the opportunity that we have is the diversity that has been created, like it or not, by our history. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's, it's and, and, and what, is the, what is the lesson of this diversity then, you know? I mean, we have a group of people, we have Black people who are speaking English, we have Black people speaking French, along with other languages, probably speaking about three or four different languages and so forth scattered and taking on all these various aspects of identity. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I'm saying the choice for us is never a simple black or non-black because the, the, the question of blackness itself 
is already a complex one yeah. in terms of in t- if we're talking about definition you know what i mean and 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 the idea and the seduction of definition we have to wonder where is that coming from because there's a certain culture that needs definition in a particular way if you look at african languages for example a lot of I, I don't know much about African languages, but I know of the language that I speak, which is influenced by African languages, and from my very very cursory um, looking at, at 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 studies of and even looking at an African language, context matters in terms of meaning. The idea of simple definition is is something that if you look at several aspects of our cultural expressions, it's it's it's, it's not easy. The polar opposites of good and evil within our spiritual traditions. It's not, it's not, I don't know that definition is where black people will find themselves. It may be something else, but I don't know that definition is the thing that that typifies and exemplifies our own innate poetics, our own innate kind of ways of philosophizing, our own needs, um, our own ontological needs. I don't know that definition is the thing that that kind of defines our deep ontological need. Um, mm-hmm. for identification and so on and so forth. Um, so, yeah. Would, would you say that Walcott was quite um, consumed with the idea of, of definitions because there was a lot of mention of being black and rejecting what's not black and the, the issues with that. Was he quite concerned with definitions and, and labels? No, I think, he, I think he cherished ambiguity a lot more because his own position was very ambiguous in the Caribbean in that battle, that epic battle, if you want to call it, of races, if you want to think about it in that way, and cultures. He was, he was racially mixed, um, divided yeah. to, the, to the vein, as he says, um, and also not just, not, just by, not just helplessly mixed ethnically, but he loved the English language and he loved English literature, but he also loved the West Indies and he loved the people there as well. Right uh, in the chat, it's being said he called himself uh, mulatto of style. Yeah. So even his style is considered that. And you know, a deeper study of Walcott will show his deep interest in Africa, or in 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 the poetics of of black uh, culture and art is in his drama as well. There's an essay I think called Meanings that he talks about what he hopes to evolve in West Indian drama. And he had a the Trinidad Theatre Workshop, which is one of the greatest theatre um, ensembles in the Caribbean, and anywhere maybe um he was the one who started it and ran it for a long time in the mm-hmm. theater there was some a vision that was slightly different i think to to what he did in poetry and i think maybe even looking at that may give one a deeper sense of what he wanted his interaction with um what blackness brought what africa brought to the caribbean what he wanted it to be and realized as um yeah okay so would you say that um would you say that perhaps his artistic slash creative background influenced his, his worldview, particularly his ideas Definitely. around power and, and race. Definitely, and I think I agree with him if I am to insert myself in it as well, mm-hmm. because I think we, you know, I, even if you look at some of our politicians, the, 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 the so-called fathers of the nation and so on, the real fathers of the nation, yes, respect due to them, um, but, but, but Walcott has a point in starting to at least get us to question the degree to which the real liberation happens through politics, which is not to say that politics will not aid in that, which is not to say that politics has not, doesn't have a major role in that. But there is usually, an, perhaps there's an over-dependence on politics to do that. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, in terms of speaking about the quality of people and, and, and their inner lives, I'm not sure what politics could do uh, on its own for the inner lives of people. And what usually happens is that you find politics and art at like, you know, the ends, the different ends of things, usually with art seen as a fantasy world, whereas politics many times is a fantasy world, (laughs) you know? And art is talking about possibilities, real possibilities. So, you know, I do think he has a point in you see, it's about combinations of these contributions, not so much of rejecting one and taking on the other. I do think he has a point in asserting the role of art in what he calls West Indian militancy, or even if we extend it to, to something like Pan-Africanism, how are we seeing, if we're ca- kind of seeing our, our artists in the same way that Europeans see their artists as existing in this kind of other world that's not quite real, et cetera, 
um, albeit that they give the artists a lot of money, <laughs> but I still think there is this idea that I think he is right in, and I think if you think of our contributions to the world and how we have kind of taken the world by storm, it has been through art. Yeah. It has been through art. I mean, we're influencing people worldwide now, positively and negatively, through our art. Um, so I do think he has a point there. And I do think, yes, his, his position is, is, is definitely coming from that. And, and I think it's because art links him to spiritual considerations. Very often I find lacking in, in political movements associated with blackness. I find a very, very deep ambivalence to black spirituality and African spirituality. And I wonder why, and I wonder what are the ramifications of that? Because the spirituality of a people is something at the center of that people. So, you know, when it's left out, what is left? You know, what are the ramifications of that? So, yeah. So could that be something that was perhaps considered one of his contributions maybe to Pan-Africanism is maybe uh, trying to maybe almost reconnect people with the spiritual side of things and not just the, the, the politics of the movement. Would you say yeah, that's maybe that he contributed? Yeah, I don't think it's, he's not overtly ex engaging in a kind of self-conscious spiritual discourse, but he is, what he's pointing to is essentially talking about spirituality, about the yeah. poetics of a certain kind of spirit, a certain kind of spirituality that could be liberatory, you know? Um, I, I mean, just, <laughs> I don't know, in terms of the politics and what has happened, um, I don't know, there seems to be a certain kind of dead end. You know, there seems to be this sense of, there seems to be something that happens in terms of a kind of spiritual vacuity or something like that, spiritual vacuousness, because, because what becomes of those people? We see so many people who look so promising and they're guerrillas who are going to rise and are to liberate the people and they turn into tyrants yeah. against those very people. Yeah. So, so what is missing then, you know, what is missing? Very interesting. So um, is it fair, do you think, to say that Walcott was seemingly more critical of black power than he was of colonialism, which at times, for me, it almost felt like he romanticized it a little bit at times. Um, I, I, I wouldn't measure it. I, I, I wouldn't say more. I definitely wouldn't say more. I mean, a lot of Walcott's work is speaking against colonialism is speaking mm. against the kind of crimes that, that, that went on there. A lot of it. I mean, one of his problems with Naipaul, Walcott and Naipaul were famous um, you know, rivals at some point in time. One of his problems with, with Naipaul was how Naipaul kind of espoused the vision of, of Europeans and, and of colonialism, how Naipaul was engaging in a kind of neo-colonialism in terms of his outlook to Walker. Um, mm. So so I'm saying that he, he, he had perhaps a, a he stands at the center of a necessary ambiguity and ambivalence, but he was intense in everything he did. So he, he did intensely critique empire throughout his career. In fact, he's probably known more for that. The, the, the Black Power period was a period of time, but his career spanned a much longer period of time. And one of the things you know he definitely had a problem with was empire, mm. you know? Um, and even down to his last collections, he was talking about the, the, the new versions of empire through, um, you know, free market economy or whatever. He's talking about the tourism um, and how it's kind of a kind of silent killer within the islands as well, a kind of neo-colonialism. It's, mm -hmm. his, it's his topic. It's his, it's his theme, actually, you know. So definitely, I wouldn't say that he, the Black Power period was a period where he thought there was a need. I'm not going to completely defend him there. I do think Black Power was a complex movement as well. But in terms of just speaking about him, I think at the time of Black Power, he he was he he embodied and he also tried to um, um, be a proponent of a kind of necessary ambiguity, a kind of like com complex uh, complicating the issue a little bit. Okay, okay. So just to finish, so my last question to you would be: um, What do you think is a, a lesson, perhaps, that we can learn from from him in terms of his life and work? It's an important lesson we could take. Um, I, I think that at, uh, speaking within the context of Pan-Africanism is that that constant need. And I think it might, I mean, it might seem cliche, but 
but it's one of the things that is the kind of repeated sin of a lot of movements, which is the fact that it does not, I think two things. One, the, the understanding is that there's a need to replace not people, you know, in power, not, not um, even the twin ideologies or whatever of the right and the left. It's not the mat that's not the matter to me. The matter is, um, is actually a change of that whole system in a way that holds both the left and the right together. Because the left and the right are also provincial productions of a particular culture and way of seeing and worldview. The idea is that whatever has to come has to do things fundamentally differently and not be fooled by the notions of, of these two polar opposites that are somehow really at, you know, I don't know. I, 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 I think that, that that central ambiguity starts to introduce um, a productive position where there is a recognition of what needs to change is the spirit of what is happening. And for that to happen, there needs to be a dedication to freedom within the movement. And you know what that does? Because the movement is so driven by a desire for power for people who are disempowered, it helps them to temper their philosophy of power to understand that whatever power they're seeking must not encroach on people's power to evolve and to be different things. Um, and that's what I think many leaders do not know um, how to do. The idea is they have the ideas, there's the need to empower people and they need to go forward. But no matter how much the drive forward is intense and it needs to happen, it needs to happen. It needs to be informed by a philosophy of claiming power that is also willing to allow people their individual power, allow people their individuality, allow people their their um, their own personal power to be and to go along the course of a destiny that could be completely opposite to to whatever the movement is. It, I don't know how it's going to get done. I'm not a politician <laughs> or a, a leader, but but that but if we have to look at the history of, of of our leaders worldwide in in the Caribbean, in Africa, maybe even in some degree in the United States, becoming tyrants themselves, there is something that we do have to look at. Right. Um, so, yeah.